let's wrap up here, okay? I, I know it's a hard thing to get done in time, but let's wrap up, please. No, might not be able to solve it yet, so. So how, how did it feel? You, you were like a god or a goddess, huh? You were holding all these systems in your hand? Okay. So again, we're taking uh, kind of the constructs from programming. We've got these systems we're putting out here. Now, who wants to explain their model? Sure. <laughs> so there's... Uh, well, so I, it's hard to explain. One of the things I guess we came across is in terms of like these, uh, in terms of having binary connectors, sort of just one to one, it seemed like a lot of them should be a lot more than that. Um, so I mean, so we started at the beginning, you know, the, with the biggest stuff like the Earth, and then that hooks up to you know, the country, and then the state hooks up to the country, and the Earth and the country hook up to the environment, and then sort of from the environment and the state, we started hooking up uh, sort of the social and the economic, um, and then and using things like groups and institutions and organizations as the connectors between something like the environment and the social system, or the environment and uh, the economy. Um, and we didn't manage to actually get the city's connector in there, so I guess things are going to go pretty badly. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens if I come in and, I don't know, I, I, I just perturbed your system, what happens? Uh, it, yeah, it's different. It's different, isn't it? Presumably some things that were connected aren't connected now, and some things that weren't connected before <laughs> so again, the principle of nested systems, uh, one system. Now, it could be uh, you could take a little system. I took a little system and shook the whole thing. Uh, I hate to ruin your piece of art here. But I could take the big one. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I think, yeah. You, it's like a It could be. Yeah, it could be. Because they, they just really messed with the earth right there, didn't they? Yeah, that's like an action movie, so... All right. How about this group, please? Okay, so what we, I think, I'm not sure if I'm you know, correct, but I think what we try to do is to model one of the countries, uh, and then the system would be made by the interaction of those two models representing Ukraine on one side and Russia on the other side. And what we started doing, first of all, is to focus on the actors that, uh, you know, that, that are part of the system. So they are the country as opposed to the state, and we thought that the two are different. And then the groups, the different types of social groups, even, you know, individuals that operate uh, within uh, this context. Uh, and then we tied uh, these three actors uh, together, but also with the kind of factors that influence how these actors behave, which are the social and economic uh, situations of, uh, of the two you know, countries, or as we want to call them. So that's as far as we went. Uh, but towards the end of the exercise, we realized that perhaps we should have clarified the question, the problem that we wanted to, to solve, and we haven't done that of the answer. Uh, so that, that would have been, you know, maybe a better way to solve. So, as always, with your re and, and again, modeling is going to depend on your research question. So let's let's see how closely yours are connected. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So again, maybe maybe uh, instead of tightly knit, loosely, loosely, yeah, loosely connected systems. So. Makes sense a little bit. It's hard to think about that and translate it, and how do we put it into uh, computer code, and how do we move on? So. Uh, again, agent-based models, when we think about taking what we just did and putting that into or translating into an agent-based model, um, very flexible, one of the most flexible forms uh, or formats to simulate complex systems. Uh, and again, uh, network analysis and then also uh, agent-based models are the ways that we can learn more about complex systems. In my opinion, I think you use both if you can and learn as much as you can. So we can look at those models, we can direct the agent actions and emotions, attributes, and we can do that more explicitly, and we'll get into that as we go along. So, so what's our rationale? Uh, so it can be modeled, we just modeled it, right? We, we modeled a complex phenomenon. Uh, again, we can extend or, or add on to our analytical tools. I, I like the idea, there's some people that say, hey, you know, throw out the analytical tools. I, I just like including everything that I can. I mean, it's a good regression, it's a good regression. I mean, it says something. I may not agree with it completely or totally, but it gives me some information. And some things are predictable. 
Uh, some things now, remember what, when you think about uh, traditional science, that's based on past events. Okay, so something new that comes up like the Arab Spring, uh, maybe with Twitter and Facebook uh, that's uh, considered emergent, could be considered emergent. So maybe in the 1990s, the 2000s, you might not have predicted that. So complex systems gives us the ability to uh, maybe look at some transitions or phase transitions uh, where emergent things happen, emergent properties. We didn't know it was going to happen. Surprises. Okay, something a little bit different the system gave us. Uh. So again, we, we saw interdependent systems, right? Some were locked together really tightly, some not as uh, much. We saw networks, right? we saw networks of entities connected. Uh, tipping point, the Earth uh, just got a, what, uh, a, big, a big rock hit it, right? We saw the Earth didn't do that well. Uh, feedback, so what we didn't really talk about in those systems, uh, they didn't have feedback, did they, or feedback loops. So that's critical. Uh, feedback loops are critical for information and for learning. Uh, Non-equilibrium dynamics, and a, uh, life can be so non-linear. Pagel said that, life can be so non-linear. So what are some of our rationales? Uh, again, it's not just uh, the humans, it's the humans and the environment. Uh, it's that feedback of information. Again, simultaneously, things happen at the same time. Uh, we can look at maybe the residual errors, maybe some of the things, things in the data that we don't see uh, in our regressions. Maybe something are hidden under the surface. Maybe things are a little subtle. Uh, Agent-based models give us a chance. Uh, if we put some good stuff into them to figure out some of those things. So again, back and forth interactions, things happen at the same time. Uh, again, are, are they uh, predictability of agent-based models? Um, again, not the strongest characteristic of them. Uh, probably a better forecaster, or maybe to give you insight, or better, or those are, tend to be the words that are used for agent-based models. Um, what they can do is reinforce. Uh, now, I, okay, say we have a military pattern. Uh, that uh, you know on the ground that works. Well, maybe we build a model and, and all the data tells us this and we can match out that those movements are effective. We can prove what we already know or we can prove what's on the ground or we can prove strategies that might work. Um, again, cause and effect, where's control in a complex system? Where's control? So we think, we, it's dispersed, yeah, we think um, uh, Scott Page said, notice in a complex system that uh, agents can influence almost everything and control almost nothing. So think about the uh, systems from the bottom up. Remember the ants? Nobody's, nobody's telling those ants what to do. The birds when they flock in the sky, knowing the bird, right bird isn't calling the left bird and texting them and telling them you've got to fly here and fly there. Okay, so. Is that making sense a little bit? It's a little bit different because we're used to top down, the hierarchy telling things to do. But, but can a hierarchy really make you do something? I, besides, I know a fascist regime and guns they can. But you think about uh, the one child uh, policy of population control in China. Okay, it had to come from the bottom up. It had to come from the norms, from, from the people. Because it's natural for people to make, right? I mean, that's a natural human drive. So how do you legislate? You can't force people not to have babies. So what you do is you just provide incentives. Making sense a little bit? So that's like you can force the policy or you can work from the norms from the bottom up. Uh, explanatory uh, and illustrative. Uh, I think a picture tells a thousand words. Uh, every time I uh, look at people's models or I look at ones I work on, I learn something different that I haven't. It makes, uh, again, instead of a snapshot and the story and qualitative and quantitative, we've got the movie. We've got kind of a research movie. And I can see what's happening on these interactions. Why is that happening here? It gives you different questions to prompt you. Uh, not only that, then you've also got outcome graphs, which we'll show you a little bit later. So say uh, we'll, we'll do Russia and Ukraine. These agents are moving toward and back. And they've got these patterns of interactions because of maybe some story or some event. And then you, you can follow the tracking on the outcome, what you want to pick to measure on the outcome. Does that make sense a little bit? So instead of one outcome like we get in regression, we can keep following that regression over time. Say our model, remember, we don't have to freeze time. We can take a model, uh, we can model the time, say, uh, one classroom time, maybe a half hour. 
uh, five years, ten years, uh, or time might not matter. Okay, it might not be the most important part of your research. You can do it that way. So our research applications, uh, social science, we're looking at relationships of the co collective. That's what we want. But we got to find meaning that individuals put on in their actions. In fact, a lot of you talked about your research today from the bottom up. What's, what's going on with some of those uh, uh, individual groups and, and norms in the bottom. So we got top down, bottom up. Uh, we can either, again, just what we talked about, change the structure, okay, or, or change the values. And how different people interpret the world, that's what we're looking at. And the units of social reality, again, the micro or the macro. We've got the collective or the individual agent level. So again, some different uh, ways to conceptualize agent-based models. Uh, Tendency toward reductionism. We repeat the same on the same system. Uh, we got to be precise. It tends to be static and optimizing and homogeneous uh, agents. Uh, Agent-based models, again, we talked about are flexible. Uh, we get dynamic processes. Uh, we've got the potential for adaptation, emergence, learning, uh, heterogeneous agents. I just think that's the coolest thing. You can, and we'll do that this afternoon if you get a chance. You'll, you'll be able to model, the, they call them turtles. Okay, they're just agents, and you can, uh, you, can, you can make all different types of agents, uh, turtles, whatever you want to. You can make them either physically representative as people or as turtles, okay, yeah, depending on you know, what your preference is. So we got different types of research design. Uh, what we're really looking at is experimental. We're going to say what is. Uh, Quasi-experimental, what is? Case study, what is? The complex systems, we can look at uh, what could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I said in the last slide, sir, there's yeah. a distinction between iterative or simulations and yeah. like metrics and, and complexity science. What's the chief distinction, or are they? What's happening? You can incorporate learning in like these traditional, or you can incorporate learning and change in strategy yeah. in various iterations. Yeah, what, what's happening is the two are starting to come together. Okay, for example, a structural equation modeling, some, some of the higher level of modeling. Um, I have two friends that uh, they didn't have anybody to do the complexity science part for their dissertation, so they did structural equation modeling. So it approached, it approached some of the ways and the techniques that you can handle in complexity. So, so they're getting closer. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I mean, is there, so for a novice like myself, is there a, a distinction? I mean, like, like the value added of doing iterative stuff and agent-based versus traditional? I mean, I would take it from traditional and apply it to the agent-based. Okay. That, that's, and then you have a different way that you can present your data and a different way, you know, you have a, again, it depends on your research question. But you have a different way that you can tell the story or a different way you can see how things interact over time. Sure. Like maybe you have a time series, right? Like every month, but here we can, if you tell me the same rules for the market for the whole year, maybe we do the whole year, or maybe we do 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's what the agent based model allows us to do. Did I answer that? Close enough? Yeah. Okay, good. <coughs> so we've got the analytical tools, conceptual tools, and simulation tools. And again, the one we're going to talk about mostly today is our agent based model. Uh, these are research options uh, for simple, complicated, complex, and complex adaptive systems. Uh, the difference between a complex system and a complex adaptive system, obviously, is the word adaptive in learning. Okay. Sometimes they're used simultaneously. Uh, so just uh, we've got our snapshot, we've got our linear, and then we've got a way to kind of capture it. So just another way to look at it, uh, the different types of policy research. Again, I like putting them all in together. That's me. I like putting as much in as you can. My ideal research would be to use qualitative, quantitative, network, agent-based model, simu uh, sensitivity analysis, every analysis I could. I'd love to run to see if there's any difference from the outcome on all the different methodology, and that's my goal someday to do that. In fact, I'll probably uh, end up working on that in tobacco policy because a lot of the data is already there. So all models are computational. In the sense, we can apply them to SPSS, Data, NetLogo, MetLab, and we'll go over some of the other ones this afternoon. 
Again, a new way to look at uh, research. Uh, the third way is uh, we combine them all together, qualitative, quantitative, and agent-based modeling. So how would that work in the real world? Um, I went to Ghana uh, a couple weeks ago, about three weeks ago. So classroom climate in northern Ghana. Uh, handed out the survey. So I've got a survey on classroom climate. Pretty standardized international form. Uh, again, working with policy issues in education. Uh, so I've got uh, that data right there. So nine different uh, characteristics of what the climate is and what contributes to it. Uh, then on the other side, I have observational data. So I've got my uh, iPad just taping the whole room. So I'm looking at what's going on movement-wise, what's going on with the interactions, uh, what's going on with the language, and how can we measure and count that. So what I'll do is I'll put those all together. I'll, I'll run some network analysis of it, uh, and then I'll, I'll use that. I'll use all that data, the qualitative, the quantitative. I'll, I'll put it all into numbers. I'll help build my uh, network, and then I'll help build my agent-based model. Make sense a little bit? A little bit? OK. So hopefully I'll get a different picture than I would if I just used my regression. Maybe I won't. I might not find out anything. But again, I'm trying to get to what happens at that local interactions. Uh, when you look at education policy and educational policy research, for example, there isn't really a lot of student level data, which I found totally shocking. So I have student level data, which is going to tell us something different. Um, you know, uh, a solution for average is very different for an individual. So a lot of the education policy data is on averages. Mm -hmm. um, so when you have the like qualitative participant observation data, yeah. did you sort of go back after the fact and try to distill the hours and hours of stuff you saw into like some small number of like rules that you could throw exactly. into NetLoad or whatever and just run into a bunch exactly. of things? Okay. Exactly. Yeah, and how we'll do it, that's a really good question because we're trying to discern right now the best way to do it. Um, one simple way to do networks is, uh, if we were going to do it today, that was an interaction here, it's an interaction back. So you count those interactions with those people. Uh, if you had a different type of data, um, maybe we could weigh it, which was heavier. Uh, li like, like you and I interacted 20 times, that might be a heavier weight than maybe you and I don't interact all day, which is okay too. So that, again, so there's a way, there's lots of different ways to use that data to, to maybe quantify it even more, maybe to give you potentially more outcome. Yeah, that's a good question, so. So again, uh, just co-evolving research design. This is just one way to say put them all in there together. Uh, I'll take your research, see if I can't grow, and pass it on to Dan, who's working on IR. And he's going to do a model on this part of it. And maybe you're going to do it on tribes, and you're going to do it on this. And so how can we use everybody's data to kind of keep pushing knowledge or theory forward? So benefits. Um, actually, there is a high degree of uh, analytical rigor, because uh, remember your models are all based on data and verification of the models. Uh, simple rules based. All complex systems are based on simple rules. Okay. That's, that's, a, that's a, if you think about it, all simple rules. Uh, you look at birds on flocking. How do they do that? Um, they just follow the bird ahead. Another rule is don't bump into the other bird. Another rule is it's better to be in the middle if you can, but if you can't, it's better to be in the flock than not to be in the flock. So those are the simple rules. Uh, we can look at new impacts, and uh, what I like is we can systematically explore uh, the impacts of each variable. So say, say teaching, say teaching policy. Uh, maybe uh, you have a teacher, you can, you, you can look at the data, a teacher and their interactions who's taught for a year. Maybe somebody who's taught for 10 years. How, do those, how does it matter? How does it look? I can systematically look from the data and run that experiment each time. Okay. So again, we talked about uh, heterogeneity in the uh, types of agents, the flexibility of cognitive assum uh, assumptions. Uh, your agents are empowered with the ability to make decisions. So if you and I are in a fight, uh, we're in a community fight over resources. Um, I can either approach or avoid you, and I have certain rules what I do when I, when I, when I run into you. Okay. Symbolically, when I run into you in the model, when, when we meet up, in our paths meet. So agents don't have to be optimizing, which is very different from uh, usually how we approach things, uh, just goal-oriented. 
There's a volition to agents. There has to be some reason that they're doing this. There's something that drives their behavior. And that's where we come in. Uh, that's where we come in. I, I found it very interesting. I've been very fortunate. I've been to a lot of uh, maybe physics and computer science conferences. And uh, I've seen uh, a number of models that are modeling, modeling policy. And the models are amazing, but there's no theory behind it. They, they don't have the, the literature and the theory behind it. And, and so again, if we can team up, I mean, they've got the good mathematics skills and the modeling. So that's something that we've got a really important part to play as far as adding our policy and our expertise to add to those models. And again, multiple uh, interdependent sources of influence and outcome. Again, some of the things we've already talked about. Um, doesn't cost a lot, OK? NetLogo is free uh, if you downloaded it. Uh, if you want to learn it, uh, there's tutorials. Uh, no, there's also a community, uh, a community site you can ask questions if you get stuck. And I found people amazingly generous with their time. In fact, uh, the person who's coming this afternoon is very generous with his time, is writing the textbook. Just wrote it on uh, NetLogo, which is a really cool thing. So, um, Large amounts of data really, really fast. I, I put like millions of agents in, and they just, they just fly, and they move. And, so I can either put 100 agents in, 300, 500, or 5,000. Okay, it doesn't make any difference. It's just you can change the parameters on the on the models. Uh, not constrained by physical reality. And again, instead of you can't, always, you don't always have a chance to build your counterfactual. So it gives you a chance experimentally to see what would happen, how you would build that. Okay, like everything else, when we tried to model up here, we can't model everything. Uh, we can't control the outcomes. Uh, again, sometimes computers uh, lack that intuitive kind of little nuance on really how she should really uh, categorize that independent variable. Uh, bias sometimes in top-down modeling. Um, I have a total bottom-up bias, okay? I, I, think, I think the best modeling is bottom-up. You can do sometimes a combination. It doesn't mean you can't have a hierarchy from the top in, 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 in pressing down policies or behavior. But again, I believe things happen from the uh, agent level or the local level. That sort of thing. Because remember, nobody tells those ants what to do. And you may have a policy uh, in China that you only want child, but no, one, no one's there when you make that final decision whether to have a child or not. That's up to you. That's, that's your volition. That's your choice. Free will, if you will. Uh, no models are ever fully uh, verifiable or valid. And again, we talked about limited prediction. <gasps> oh, this is a slide that kills everybody. It's just so busy, isn't it? It is like, what in the world? So you go to your first uh, complexity class, all right? And you see this slide, and you go, oh my gosh, this is going to be the longest semester. Oh my gosh, this is going to be the longest workshop. So pretty busy slide. Uh, and it's pretty, it is the standard one. Uh, when you go through workshops and things, this is pretty much the standard one. And it's on Wikipedia. You can find it. So what do we have? We have all these agents down here. They're connected, OK? Self-organization. they got local relationships. No one told you where to sit today. No one told you how to put the models together. That was self-organization, came from the bottom up. So you've got all this information when you were building the models. You were getting feedback. So what came out? I had no idea what was going to come out. This is the first time, usually every other time, everything is tied or linked to everything very, very tightly. This is the first time they were a bit loose. Both, both, both models were loose. Okay, Just a different way of looking at it. So unintended, uh, unintended things came back. So what did you do if you were going to do the exercise again? You might do it a little bit differently. With that feedback, you might learn how to do it a little bit different. So again, and all this is happening in a changing environment. So that's, that's, uh, that's complexity on one slide. But we need better models. <laughs> So let's look at some of uh, what, are, what are some of the terms that we use in agent-based models. Again, we're real comfortable with regression and correlation and, and statistics, and that, that, that makes sense to us, and we get it, and when to use it. Um, models are based on assumptions. I assume, uh, say for Ebola, there's a 97% infection rate, whatever the date. That, that is my assumption. Hopefully, I, I would want it based on data, but that's what I'm going to I'm going to do this model on. Okay. Uh, the rules are the rules are if you come in contact with any agent, become this close, uh, you can catch Ebola or you can get the virus. Uh, agents uh, can be doctors, nurses, right? Uh, people who live in a country. 
The environment, uh, you can pick the environment. Um, again, it's going to react. Maybe if you have an environment with a water shortage or a drought, that's going to have more impact on Ebola. Okay, because it takes water, remember, and uh, they said the research water and electrolytes and things to keep your body up, to keep your resistance from uh, going down from it. Uh, you can put information in there, time, energy. Uh, energy is probably one of the hardest, uh, most challenging things to conceptualize and models, and it's the most important thing. Hello, how are you? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, I thought, I thought you were just going to join us. So. Are you waving? I really thought you were waving, but that's okay. So when you think about energy, all systems operate on energy. Okay, and everybody knows about entropy. Energy dissipates, okay, dissipative energy. So we've got to figure out what energy represents uh, in economics and maybe money. Okay, uh, maybe power. You've got, you got to figure out what those resources are and how you, you characterize energy. And uh, our speaker will talk about that a little bit later because I know that's their area of expertise and that's what they're good at. So. Uh, definitely feedback loops. Uh, feedback loops were going on up here. Well, did you try that? No, did you do that? So again, working together on that. Fitness function. Um, how do you know your model's doing what it's doing? Is it doing a good job? How do you measure that? It's really tough. How do you know your policy's doing a good job? Uh, did you get 12% outcome? Did you want 15? How do you know the model's really responding in the way that it should? And how can you measure that? And then simple, just verification and validation. So again, all different ways to apply to research. Uh, we've got policy process, game theory, wealth distribution, leadership, voting is usually a big one, uh, war, terrorism, innovation, altruism, selfishness, a lot of the topics that you talked about today. So just some of the constructs, if you can think about it, it's rule-based. Okay. You've got these simple rules that you want to enact on paper. When, when this meets this, this does that. If, if I have this assumption that I hate all Russians and, and you're Ukrainian and you come up to me, what's a consequence? What's that action? How can we model that into the program? Uh, how do we do that? Through equations, theories, principles, assumptions. Okay, that's what we're good at, the theories, right? We know the literature. We know what the other research has said. Um, descriptive. Uh, we want to be able to describe exactly what happens to, to detail, to degree. So when we have a model and we're working with a programmer who are the most wonderful human beings in the world, uh, we want to be really specific and precise uh, in how to do that. In your uh, handout, uh, there's a uh, guide in the back. Again, sign of the it's agent-based model development checklist. And again, this will help you. This will help you go through some of these questions and how to determine what's important when you're building your models. So we've got verbal stories, narratives. Uh, we want to look. Uh, we can say, hey, what happened in the past in IR? I know someone just went through someone's research. They just went through the last 2,000 years of war. Uh, that was their research. Do we want to know what's happening now, or do you want to uh, look at the future? What would a future scenario be? So that's what we can use these models for. Uh, the logic. Uh, again, logic based on equation based uh, algorithms and again, usually looking at insight and not prediction. So. Everybody doing okay? We need a break? Everybody okay? So conceptualization, again, these are different ideas. Again, just, just thinking through, taking your research that you normally do, how can we think of it in a different way? And how can we add the dynamicism of simulation to add to it? And I think exploratory is what if. And I'll show you an example of a, a what if model. Some of the approaches, again, what we talked about, you can even do past, current, future. But how about hypothetical? What if you want to try out a strategy that hadn't been tried out before? You may not have the money. Uh, you may not have the resources. But uh, given good enough data, this is maybe a different way to look at it. So who uses these models? Um, some of the best models are evolutionary. What is that? That just means they grow. Okay, it's based on feedback. Uh, so I know the US military uh, has a model that uh, they constantly use on the ground that's being updated with information. So uh, for example, there was a general that said, uh, hey, I'm getting the feel the situation on the ground reminds me something of Vietnam. Can you give me that information, right? So I got that information and then made a decision based on the ground, based on the past, then fed that decision back into the computer. 
So it's constantly growing to get up to date. Now, not all the generals use it on the ground, but my understanding from the person who worked on it, the smart ones do. So it, again, they don't use it for sure, but they kind of test out their, their feelings or their intuition and see what the past patterns have said and see if that can help them predict. So again, another way to think about uh, this type of work is just what patterns are doing, what patterns are saying, how they can help us, how we can recognize them. So again, today if we were going to do this again, we could say uh, it was an event driven. We, if we wanted to do the modeling with the systems again, we could come up with our problem. Uh, if we want to do experimental design, uh, combination, uh, whatever, whatever option that works for you. So again, talked about this before, what makes a good model. Bottom up and randomness. Anything that nature does, uh, we probably want to copy. So we got these assumptions, assumptions should be simple. Okay. Uh, the simulations, uh, we want the complexity to be shown in the outcomes. And uh, the individual elements need to stay simple, and that's a hard skill. It takes a while, because you, you have this agent, you want them to do everything and be everything, and we, we need to find out what's important. That's where the art comes in research. And again, there are no guidelines for ideal levels of simplicity. If you get one, let us know, okay? It would be wonderful. All right, so key assumptions. You've got these agents. Okay, these agents could be simple agent. What's an example of a simple agent? In an economic market, right? I, I go and I buy, I, I buy low and sell high. That could be just a simple agent. A uh, fixed agent, uh, every time the price gets, a bread in Egypt gets below a dollar, I do this. Or every time the bread is here. Uh, sophisticated, again, you can have them thinking, um, Religious values, uh, economic values, you can part that, tie that all together and then adapt it. Okay, so once I have all this uh, knowledge and values and systems and I can change my behavior based on some rule. Uh, the agents, again, they have movement, decisions, and emotions you can program in. Rules are threshold based, so positive and negative feedback. And again, you write those rules into the code. So when we did this modeling exercise, what did we do? We brainstormed. That was the first time we kind of thought about how these systems, uh, how we can conceptualize them, how we could model them. Uh, again, instead of behaving in isolation, uh, the scale, we, we did a mini scale, didn't we? So we think about different ways to scale those and why this would be bigger, why that would be longer, and these are some of the questions we need to think about when we're starting to develop these. That's the tough part, how simple. And again, with practice uh, and, and working in some good teams, you can, you can get a good handle on this. So what do we do? We've got this framework of these, these models. We've got to ID the uh, parts of the structure. What are their parts and the connections? That's what we did. We, we identified some in the, in the exercise. Um, if we went a little bit farther, uh, let's see, we pulled one of the links out of the chain. What are the possible outcomes? And uh, how each state of these uh, parts change over time and interactions. So again, we'd have this on a computer printout. So I think one way to do it is to start in your head. Uh, search for someone else who's already done it. Uh, NetLogo has some wonderful models on there. And uh, you can extend it. Say there's a voting model you're interested in voting. You can extend the model. Use what they've done. Always cite them, but use what they've done. Uh, if you have trouble extending the model, uh, ask somebody on the community network and they'll be able to help you with it. Uh, one way you can do is, is, is draw or get an idea visually in arrows. And uh, this is what helps me. It may not be, oh, this was a, uh, this is a kind of a fun model. It was a nanotechnology model on policy. You know, how, how the human species, how it was going to live forever. This was a teaching model. So you've got these, uh, if you take these nanotechnology you, you move faster, okay? You're smarter, okay? You live longer. Anyway, I could spend a lot of time on it, but on human, uh, so just to give an idea, let's see. So kind of for a teaching model, let's see. We just lost it, didn't we? Here we go. So what do we want to do? Prepare a new simulation? Okay, so here's the agent size. So I can make the agent small or big. 
So here I'm going to make them kind of big because I think it's fun. And what I'm going to do is, uh, I could spend a lot of time on the rules, but what's happening? They're picking up uh, technology as they go. And what happens, uh, if you see an output chart, uh, they live the maximum lifespan, which gets about to be 550 years. So what happens when you run it again? I do a little, hold on, hold on, stop, stop. I stop. So I can make it a little bit smaller so you can see. Uh, where's the output graph? Over here. Again, the yellow ones, the yellow ones, uh, you, you see rich ones and poor ones on here, and basically, the poor ones die off. And what is it? The rich get richer, right? The rich, and you come out here and you look at that, uh, and they live how long? Okay, live about 500 years. So again, just a way to show it. Uh, just kind of a fun model to play with. So. So again, how, just, just think about the connections, who connects with who, these are the hours, how you start. Uh, how do you design them? Again, that's what we talked about, abstract, we ID the elements, the implications, the different design levels we'll get into, uh, the interactions. Another way to, to look at it, uh, these are a lot of things to look at, but here are the design levels right here. Let's see if we view this. Ah, sorry about that. Right, let's see if I can view without. That's going to do the same thing, isn't it? There we go. So there are design levels. Again, just a different way to think about. Uh, you've got the macro level environment. Remember we had the Earth that maybe kind of can shake up or, or maybe uh, an outer system can shake up one of the smaller levels. We've got the agent and then the agent society. And you can see all these things we've got to figure out. Uh, what the agent's learning is, their attributes, adaptation, behaviors. Then we've got that society. We've got collective info. We've got structure of the system, communication, regulation, adaption, interaction. So we've got a lot of vocabulary, but it'll be a little easier when we start looking at some of the models. Maybe it'll, it'll, it'll start to sink in. So types of agents. All right. What we talked about. You can have a household. You can have an individual. Voters, citizen, tribes, elected <laughs> officials. Countries, regions, states, towns, institution, animals. Anybody have anything that they're studying we didn't cover? You could use as an agent? Okay. Organizations. Organizations? Mm hmm. Perfect. Mm hmm. Bridge clubs, whatever. So each one of these agents has attributes. You could have, give them a demographic attribute, you can give them age, uh, gender, just like you do in your normal research, knowledge, beliefs, interests, uh, maybe religious preference, uh, maybe a Muslim, Christian. Uh, they've got motivation and goals, uh, strong group affiliation, I know in IR, those things are important. Uh, maybe uh, altruism or selfishness. Uh, then what we do is you plan. If this agent does this, then, if then, uh, we put in incentives. Otherwise, you wouldn't root for University of South Carolina football, would you? So I had to give you a pretty high incentive, right? Uh, they have different personality and different emotions. All right. Different behaviors. Uh, so when it, you, yeah. When you talk about attributes, are you talking a group of rules, or are you talking an attribute that has a set of rules associated with it? Okay, we're gonna, these are the attributes of the agents, mm -hmm. so that we can write the rules. Okay. We, 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 we've got to define what the parameters are of the agents. Okay. Did I answer that? Yeah. Okay. So if the, if the attribute is these kinds of agents are green and these kinds of agents are blue, there's going to be a set of different. That's correct. And we've got to be really specific. And the hard part is um, what to include and what not to include. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit later, okay? Because you want to include everything. You, you, you spend all this time on your research, you know everything about it, and you would have put everything in your model. So, 
Uh, again, so they can be reactive or proactive. Uh, they have the ability to perceive their environment, uh, social ability. They interact through language, communication, cooperation versus uh, competitive. They can be selfish and altruist. And we've got local versus uh, global information. Uh, so I guess, let's see. So net logo, that's what it looks like. That's what we're going to get into today. And they're called turtles. Uh, the agents are called turtles. And uh, you can see they look like little triangles. You can change the shape of them up here. Uh, you saw I changed the shape of my agents and the humans to look like humans. Okay, they looked a little bit like Frankenstein, but I did that on purpose. So kind of like, yeah, people live forever and take over the world. So. All right, so that's net logo. Pretty easy to do that uh, as far as setting up what the agents look like. So we've got these adaptations or these mechanisms uh, for learning. So we've got to figure out how we program those in. Uh, again, uh, they learn from their own experience, right? I learn if, uh, if I give you a million dollars to root for my team, but hey, maybe next time like, you'll take 500, right? And you'll, never vote, you know, you'll never cheer for OSU again, right? So we can imitate. So if I see uh, a leader from one ethnic group doing this, or I see a, 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 a person doing this, I can copy that. Uh, agents teach other agents. We've got reinforcement, feedback. Again, genetic algorithms, just a fancy word, just to, the things growing, the mass for things growing, and evolutionary learning. So when you think about uh, NetLogo, they've got this grid. That's the environment. Those are, they're called patches. So why our agents have attributes, the patches in the environment have attributes too. So they can interact, maybe, maybe you hit uh, a certain part of the environment and maybe prices of bread are really high. Maybe this part of the environment, they're really low. Uh, the environment can do nothing. There can be no, no interaction. It can be an open or closed environment. And again, different types of environmental elements. You can add on your structure, highways, uh, buildings to add on. I had little nanotechnology factories in the model that I showed you. So here's the environment. You have all different colors you can add to it if it has any meaning to you or significance or just maybe for visual display. So again, two ways uh, for regulation design. Uh, we can uh, do it bottom up or top down. So just give you some different ideas on that. Uh, the system level, we got size design. Uh, we talked about scale. Uh, maybe for each human being, you know, you represent them, um, you know, you have seven billion people and each, each human being is represented by one agent. Uh, maybe you put all the agents in there like the, uh, uh, there's an Afghanistan model we'll look at in a little bit, so. So we've got all this going on. We've got those uh, interaction communication design, again, uh, fixed interactions, again, just different types of networks that you can consider as far as including in there and if that will have any impact on your model. Again, this just goes in the circle, simplify, emphasize, explain. So you just keep going, iteration, how can you make it more, uh, more accurate? How can I emphasize this? Did I explain this? So we see a visual of it. So say we, uh, we agent-based model this, what we did today. How can you iteratively go back and do a better job? And these are the questions that we can ask in order to do that. Ah, oh, now's the fun part. We're going to look at birds, OK? We talked about the simple rules of birds. So let's see, net logo. <coughs> Somebody need a break? Are we OK? I'm just, you guys are like the best audience ever. Really? Okay. All right, so open up net logo. We're going to go to the models library, and we're going to go to biology. And we're going to look at flocking. Let's see. Here we go, right here. Open. So. How many, how, many, how many birds do you want? 
Let's look, let's look at the parameter up at the top. You can have up to one bird, which is going to be pretty unexciting. We can up to a thousand birds. So what, what's your pick? Thousand birds. Thousand yeah. birds. Let's go for it, okay? Uh, again, we're just, uh, we won't go into the details of these. If it, uh, so we're going to set it up. And these are the rules uh, built in the parameters. We'll look at those in a second. All right. So we're just letting them, we're just following those simple rules, okay? That birds are going to do what? Birds of a feather flock together. So anybody seen any changes? A little. So what are we going to do? We're going to turn up the speed. Turn up a little bit faster. So what do we see now? A pattern. They're starting to flock a little bit. And so each tick, if you see each tick, uh, we can get information. So if we come up here, stop, and if we go over, let's pick just less birds like that. So, so a visual, again, so when we look at that, the information in the model is, we go, that's our interface, we could, those are parameters that we can change, we modeled in what it is, it mimics the flocking of birds, it tells us how it works, what the rules are, alignment, separation, and cohesion, okay, those are the simple rules, and then how to use it, and then when you look at procedures, there's your code, okay, so actually not a lot of code for that. So when we look over here, that's one of our models, and we go back here, uh, one of my favorite, predator-prey. Predator-prey is based on what? It's limited resources in the ecosystem. So we've got to figure out, um, do we want the grass on or off? Because the grass is the environment too. Let's put it on, right? And let's just set it up, just find out what happens. Here we go. Oh my gosh, what's happening? That's a little bit too fast, and then let's slow it down. So what's happening to the population? Sheep are at one. Let's see here. Let's, again, the nice thing about these, we can just uh, set up. So how many sheep? We've got 100 sheep, 50 wolves, and 333 grasses, whatever that means, OK? So we're going to set it up. So what's happening to the populations? It's not looking good for the wolves, is it? It is a bad day for the wolves. So some of the models you can run for hours, weeks, and months. Okay. So say if you had a big data set and you're working for the government and there's stuff you wanted to know and they gave you the data, you could have millions of data points. Make sense a little bit? So if we change that, then we get a different outcome. So this gives us the flexibility to run different experiments. So we come up here. All right. Uh, you guys, we talked about ants today. Let's see. So remember, the ants are communicating with pheromones. So all the food's gone, right? So again, just a different, we won't, we won't go into the details. You can take a chance again. You've got all the information, the procedures there. Uh, all right, this is absolutely, my, I think this is one of the, the best models uh, that's been done. It, I don't know how many of you teach for research or uh, teach research classes or, all right, this is the AIDS model. So how many initial people do we want? 300 is good. 
So we got different parameters. We got coupling tendency, average commitment, uh, average condom use, and uh, test frequency. So if you're going to develop a policy, what policy would you want? Again, this is based on uh, population, like say you have real population data. What is the best? To encourage people to stay married, uh, to encourage condoms, or test frequency? So if we just start running some of the different variables. So we set it up with 300. Our average infection rate is 2.67. It's built into the system. Yeah, here we go. I know we're going through these really quick, OK? Uh, this is about HIV. Through, uh, it is known it's spread through a waste through sexual contact. There's only HIV can be spread through needle sharing. And the model examines the emergence effects of four aspects on sexual behavior, OK? So if you're four different policy choices, I should have explained that better, OK? This is their model. Yours would be different. Well, no, sure. Yeah, I'm just yeah. To figure out what I want to so that it, it makes a little bit more sense. Okay, and I can go quick through stuff too. I can be like incredibly. Okay, so um, so again, we're going to test. So that was we went, we set up, and we go. That's average coupling. Okay, tendency. If you're going to couple up. So what do we see? HIV rate is doing what? It's going up. So let's see. Let's not worry about coupling rate. Let's not worry about average commitment. You're not going to commit to anybody. You're going to use condoms all the time. As much, here we go. Condom use. There you go. Okay, so we want to move our uh, coupling up, right? We got a couple more. That's great. Wow. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can you is it possible to have a policy intervention somewhere in the middle of the time period to see what happens perhaps if you may have used condom use? Yeah, you could, you could yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so for example, so now uh, they use condoms, so let's, uh, let's keep everybody coupling and let's do testing. Anybody have any idea what testing does? So if we got lots of coupling going on, we're out of control, right? So let's uh, turn the coupling down. I'm sorry, how does policy affect coupling or commitment? Does policy do that? Are these are uh, things. Where would you want to spend your policy dollars? <laughs> on testing? <laughs> no, where, where would you want to spend? If you had, you had all these options to develop a policy. Yeah, I'm just saying, are these real I mean, how could you possibly encourage coupling or discourage coupling or encourage commitment? I mean, it seems like the last two are actually policy goals. The other two are. Like Japan is working on that right now. A lot of African countries spend a lot on encouraging people to be faithful. Uh, I'm not sure how effective that is, but there are basic big public encouragement campaigns to do that. So people try to use it as a policy variable. Again, your model is going to be differently designed. Okay, these are, this is one of the beginning models. It's just kind of now you might this is these are, are these are straight couples. You might include get. You might include the coupling average uh, propensity that's already there. You you would probably add if that was your expertise. You would add more to it. Okay. Well, also, you always need to include things like that for as um, calibration because you, know, you don't know how often. So you're trying to match some kind of data. So you need to work that in there until you get a match. And then other sliders are your policy variables. That may be a, a model calibration variable, depending on how you're thinking about it, right? Yeah, yeah. And again, there's, there's much more details on how to use it, average commitment, what it means. And then when you look at it, it looks like uh, just, just the code doesn't look that overwhelming. So. so then that gets you back into your models library. And let's see one more that would be really fun. Uh, if we want to look at networks, maybe a little bit different. Let's see. Before you leave the ACE model, yeah, I'm sorry. In, in mm -hmm. talking about complexity and building complexity into the, the rule behavior for agents, how do you interpret things like uh, test frequency when you catch your HIV questionable individuals? 
that has to be reflected in the behavior of your agents such that is there a greater or lesser probability of coupling with an agent that is HIV positive, HIV. Uh, so there has to be something built into the agents to take these into consideration. Otherwise, regard, I mean, all the average test frequency does is it changes the numbers that you have that are HIV questionable or HIV positive or negative. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't change the behavior of agents unless that's actually written into the rules that they behave differently, depending on whether or not there is no positive, no negative, or questionable, correct? In, in, in this model, I think the, uh, once somebody gets a positive test result, they don't, they, they use um, perfect practices. So once, you're, once you know you're, in, you're infected, you don't infect anybody else. People are behaving the way, in the way that that's implemented. Right, so that has uh, to be a rule that's built in. And it is, it is built into this. And you could have it be an imperfect, you know, that your, your chance to infect somebody is reduced but not eliminated, or some people care, some people don't care. You, you can play with that. You know, one thing to think about, um, at least from my perspective, a lot of these are base models. To me, it's a base model. So your expertise is, is I have a friend who's doing Ebola. Uh, you know, maybe you, you take into account, you know, gays uh, that are infected. Maybe you take into account like how many people after they're tested still, maybe 2% still go out and are sexually active without condom. That's how you add the nuances to your model. So, but it, it takes, I can only speak, it takes a heck of a lot of effort just to get a model to this point. It, uh, no, having a solid base to build on, I'd say this model is almost a solid base to build on. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've definitely, I've taught this in my class and had people just who knew a lot about epidemiology go completely ballistic say, oh, you know what, actually, I had a fast project for you. Take this thing and make it actually a reasonable representation. It turns out they know how to do that. Yeah. Um, but getting the framework here is, uh, is always challenging. But it's great, once you have the framework, you can really discuss. Yeah, and, th and this is, to me, again, I, I mean, data-driven models are great if it's really good data. And that can, and, and again, this, this, this may change. This, the, the AIDS research may change, like the Ebola. I know they're working on some agent-based models. As the data comes in, they're changing, they're changing the parameters, what's important, and they're updating as it goes along. Did that answer? Yeah, okay. you also don't necessarily have to stay within the same subject matter for a model to be appropriate. For example, if you gave the flocking model, yeah. there's a number of crowd behavior models that are based yeah. on simple flocking behaviors, and they, they have to incorporate other things, but at their heart, at their base, there's a flocking model built into them. Mm -hmm. And so you know, crowd behavior and bird behavior are very different things, but it's built on a very simple mm -hmm. bird flocking behavior. Mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. And you, we're, yeah, but so you don't bump into other people in crowds, right? I, I mean, so, yeah, they share some of the same rules, so. Uh, I'm gonna do something, uh, this is a model that, uh, let's see. All right, let's see, I can get this to work. Oh, it's not there, is it? Where is it? I don't know why it's not showing. It showed this morning. Okay. No. Nope. All right. We'll get to we'll get to that later. All right. So we did some of our flocking. Um, let's look at a, a, a different model here. Um, here's here's a. Uh, this is one of the cooler models right here. Uh, it's based on Afghanistan. Uh, again, we talked about what the goal would be. Uh, the world's becoming more interconnected, interdependent, and complex. We need to take account of dynamicism, just kind of what we did this morning. Um, look at emergence, rare events. Uh, look at some policy making considerations. And to this, an agent based model on the simulation of a citizen alliance population for Afghanistan uh, to demonstrate real world application policy studies. And uh, we'll look at the model. I'm not allowed to have the whole model because the government wouldn't let us, okay? But, uh, so that just gives you an overview of it. And uh, there's an entire book in this model. So when you take a cover shot of it, here we go. So what they did, uh, they were employed with the task uh, to figure out where Al-Qaeda would strike in Afghanistan. 
Okay, what they did was they took first the entire map of Afghanistan. They did a physical map of it. And uh, they put, thir I think there 28 million was the population of Afghanistan at the time. They put 28 million agents in there. So what they wanted to do was they got a group of social scientists together and uh, they couldn't decide on which policy to use, okay? I mean, they couldn't decide, that was the goal. For example, if Al Qaeda, where was Al Qaeda most likely to strike? So they took it based on news stories, okay? That was one of the things. So if uh, a news story, what was the impact of this news story and what would it have on the population? Did it make you more likely to move toward, uh, be more sympathetic to Al Qaeda? And they also put economic information in there. So what they found out is that uh, when bad news happened and bad news stories and economic times were bad, Al Qaeda was more likely to have more influence. Okay? So that was basically, and then it showed some of the different areas geographically. So my understanding is our government made reactions to that appropriately. So how did they come up with the model? That's the really simple version of a, a like hundreds of page book on this model. All right, this is it. So you can see lots of sliders, right? So you got the population scale. Uh, you got different uh, agents of categories, okay? They can regenerate, lots of stuff going up on here. And uh, we've got different theories. You've got, what they did was they couldn't agree at the meeting on whose theory was the best. So there, there, I, I think there were six social scientists there. So they put all the different theories in. So we saw just a base model of AIDS, but here they put different models in so you can test the same parameters. Like you may think coercion theory is the end all to be all. You may not. So what they did is they ran all the different theories. They've got legitimacy theory, representation, uh, uh, okay? And again, they combined some of those theories and they ran the model. Uh, long story short is the uh, government uh, used this model and uh, made decisions based on it. And it made intuitive sense. Mm -hmm. I would see at the bottom there, yeah. Yeah, I see posh tunes and like there's a slider. So I know, I, I imagine you like work with this model somewhat, but is there, um, are there, um, are all the other um, tribal groups taken into consideration in this model? Just curious. I, I don't. I, this this is not my model. This is oh. this is just this is one of my favorite models that, oh. to show. But I, I'm not allowed to show it because okay. it's whatever. Is that what it's called? Uh, this is the Afghanistan model. There's a book on it. I can say the information. But yeah. it just it, it just is a demo just to show you that you can incorporate a lot of stuff into these models. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Think, yeah. So, you know, passion, what about nested identities? Is there, I'm sure. Is there a way to that would be both a rule and an attribute. Yeah. So I imagine that I would, is there a way to, you know, I'm, I'm a Pashtun, if this happens, I'm a, yeah. you know, an Afghan, if this happens, I'm a terrorist, if this happens, or I'm a Taliban, if this happens. Uh, I think yeah. that's an excellent example. If, then. If your data tells you this, then I am, right. yes, yeah. if, then. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it depends on how, clever and complicated you want to get. Um, it's certainly a framework where you can do that kind of thing. And this, this idea of, of having a, a portfolio of identities and that different identities become active in different contexts is kind of a hot, a hot and important idea. And this is a, a great framework. I just, just had a really successful uh, Minerva grant to uh, ex explore that in the context of urbanization. We almost got funded. We probably will next time, I think. But, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a good a good platform for thinking about that kind of thing, although it doesn't do it for you. You definitely have to come up with a clear conceptualization and code it. All right, this is my model, and this, is, this one's fun for me. Uh, I got a chance to go to MIT and uh, work in some teams up there. We were the only scrubs that didn't have PhDs, so uh, we wanted to come up with something really cool. And how life would have it, uh, I get on these kicks. I just worry about simultaneity. Every research undergrad and graduate school, how can you account for simultaneity? And they're like, it's not on the exam, whatever. So, so again, we talked about everything happening at the same time. So uh, I wanted to say, how could you model that in a social system? So it just happened, the guy sat down and was from Germany, said, oh my gosh, we, I'm from Germany, we are looking for someone to work with to, to talk about simultaneity in social systems. Ha, okay, that's how life goes. So uh, what we wanted to do in this model, uh, first of all, we wanted to see if we could do it, okay? 
And uh, you have no idea what the model is, but I'll tell you what it is. We took, it was World Cup soccer. And what we wanted to find out, there's no data on World Cup soccer and betting. So it's a very complicated model. I'll go very, very simple. So we wanted to see what was most important. How could we model the teams? So what we did, we figured that uh, the teams were the predators and the ball was the prey. So based on predator prey that we saw, makes sense, limited resources. So those were our connections. Everything was dependent on that local interaction, what happened with that ball, okay? So we got one level, one scale. We had to figure out what scale. Did we want to go to the grass? No, that wasn't important. We wanted to go to the field. That's where all the action was, okay? So this is one level. So then we wanted to tie it into the crowd. Okay, so you made the crowd, remember the cellular autonomy that we saw, like you're, you're for my team, you know, I'm for your team, my neighbors influence me. So we tied, uh, when action happened in the game, they got excited, okay, and when they get ready to score, you'll see the different sides get, get, get excited. So this is one team's fans and that's the other team's fans. All right, gets, we got different levels, so we wanted to even do an even different level, we wanted to do global. So we've got the local field, we've got the crowd, okay? And then we did global, so we did global betting, okay? No data on it, so we just wanted to see, okay, what would happen if people bet on the game, okay? So that's our third. So we have the globe betting, we have the crowd, and then we have the players, all right? The players learn, okay? They're based on simple rules. It's called evolutionary learning, which is just a fancy way of saying each one of these soccer players up here if, I, if you're on my team and I kick the ball to you and you get the ball, we get a point. If I try and kick the ball and you're on the opposite team, I get a minus point. Okay. So again, we put it all together and we wanted to see what the outcome was. So we did teams, we went to a tournament just like the World Cup, 64 teams. And uh, again, it was actually US Germany. And uh, I'll show you what happens, okay. Uh, what I also did was I gave uh, everybody a dollar to bet on the game, okay, and uh, just to see what would happen. I didn't do that for you guys today, did I? So these players are learning and they're getting, so what's happening? Yeah, something just happened, right? They just scored. That's exciting, right? Yay. So if you had your dollar, you'd be cheering, right? Yay. Everybody see the ball? Blue's got the ball right now. Red tried to take it away. Oh, yay! Yay! So when we modeled this, uh, the soccer players are, are uh, the best we could get them to is about uh, 12 and under soccer level development. That's the best we could get them to. They started at like five and unders, okay, to coach soccer. So we got them moving a little bit better and, and passing off. Now they're getting smarter, okay? They're, they're learning. Uh, the game should be getting a little bit tougher. So we had new new idea. So we ran it two times. We ran the tournament two times. Um, when there was no betting, when there's no global betting, uh, and again, so it was based on fuzzy logic. If you want any the information, I can send it to you. But when there was no betting, it didn't matter. Offense or defense didn't matter. But when there was global betting, uh, the team with the best defense won. Okay. It's a base model. Okay, we built that in about three and a half days and didn't sleep. Okay. So what could you use? Okay, so what did, what did this model show? So it showed us different scales that we can model. Okay, in the same, same uh, agent-based model, uh, it showed that we can put uh, AI, or I presented this in artificial intelligence, uh, and, 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 okay, but also limited resources. So, um, in economics, you know, there's limited resources. These, these could be uh, different companies competing. Um, uh, resources for oil in conflict or international resolution, uh, IR. So I mean, you'd have to think. I have to think it through a little bit, but that'll just give you some idea. So again, a base model that you can apply from lots of different areas if you kind of just think it through. So why don't we take a wonderful break for about five or ten minutes, okay? And we'll let our speaker uh, take over after that. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, again, just to give you an idea of, of what's available, what's out there, and maybe how to think and, and look at things a little bit differently.